Um, just as a, as a way of sort of recapping where we left off, we had talked about the final consolidation of Muscovite authority. Moscow was going to emerge as the dominant Slavic principality of the lands of today, what constitute Western Russia, during the reign of Ivan III. Ivan the Great, as he's oftentimes known, who's credited as being the gatherer of the Russian lands because he finalizes the process of consolidating Muscovite power and subduing most of the principalities that it existed otherwise to challenge Moscow's authority. Ivan III is going to be succeeded by his son, a fellow by the name of Vasily uh, III, who I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing today. Uh, essentially, Vasily pursues policies that were similar to his father. He continues to augment and aggrandize Muscovite ideology, uh, bringing the state in closer alliance with the church, continuing the process of constructing churches, monasteries, and other buildings that are going to augment and, again, aggrandize the power of the state, and dealing with internal opposition. One of the curious things about Vasily III is he's also, he represents this moment in Russian history, and we're going to talk about this today in some detail, in which this new state, this emerging new state, is sort of caught between the past and the future, caught between its eastern legacy, its long-standing relationship as a supplicant of the, of the Khans, now having arisen to impose order on Tatars, or, or about to, we're going to get to that today, with the rising threat that it faces from the West, more dynamic, richer, more advanced from a technological standpoint, civilizations. Vasily III is going to marry not once, but twice. His first wife doesn't give birth to an heir. And uh, he is advised by some boyars, members of his elite uh, counselors, that he should marry a second time. And he does, much to the dismay of some church members, much to the dismay of a considerable number of boyars. He marries a Serbian princess. He also shaves his beard very close and begins adopting things that look almost a little bit like Western styles. And this sets the Orthodox clergy off. They're not happy about this as, as well. But Vasily's reign is going to culminate um, in uh, 1533 when he dies. He ends up dies. Uh, he's off hunting uh, and has a hip abscess or something. Comes down with an injury and ends up perishing. And he is going to pass uh, the, the crown now, the throne of Muscovy, on to his son, a fellow by the name of Ivan the Fourth, who is going to become known and become famous as Ivan the Terrible, or Ivan the Dread. We're going to have something to say about him. Ivan IV is a very fascinating character in Russian history, not only because of the apparent mental breakdown that he suffers halfway through his reign, but because his period on the throne is both long and consequential. Consequential. It is going to be under the reign of Ivan IV that Moscow makes a transition from principality to empire. It does so thanks in no small part to events that transpire in August of 1552, about the midway point of Ivan's reign. On the 22nd of August, 1552, a Muscovite army of approximately 150,000 men under the command of Ivan IV himself had laid siege to the city of Kazan, the capital of the Kazan Khanate, which is located about 500 miles to the east of Moscow at the confluence of the Volga and Kazanka rivers. What was curious about the force that Ivan had brought with him to Kazan is that it was like this, and this is the theme for today, it was like his state, sort of an admixture of the ancient and the innovative, the old and the new, the past and a possible future. The force comprised a large number of traditional light cavalry, those soldiers who had fought for centuries with spears and bows and arrows. But there were also newer regiments, and they had with them approximately 150 mobile cannon. There were foreign mercenaries who had brought in Dutch engineers and sappers who had played a very important role in the ensuing siege. And there were also native elements known as streltsi. You'll see them here in a little bit. I'll write it on the board. You'll get it. Streltsi means shooters. These were native Russian troops armed with arquebuses, those early muskets that we talked about the last time. By the beginning of Ivan's reign, Ivan IV's reign, growing numbers of these had entered into the Russian military, the Muscovite military, although they tended to serve on a temporary basis. They were not full standing professional armies of the sort that had already emerged by this time in Western Europe. On the 29th of August, a gigantic artillery barrage ensued, 
It was designed to suppress the Tatar cannons and to provide covering maneuver for the troops that would then maneuver around the city in an attempt to encircle it and cut off the Tatars. The Russians began constructing large siege towers, a medieval concept, uh, but uh, the siege towers uh, were armed with as many as 10 large and 50 smaller guns. The siege would continue until late September, by which time the Dutch engineers, or the sappers, miners, had successfully tunneled deep underground, building a tunnel, a series of tunnels towards the base of the wall of the fortress. And it was there that they packed in 48 barrels of gunpowder. The ensuing explosion ripped a gigantic hole in the walls of the fortress, and a general cannonade followed. Muscovite troops poured into the city, they isolated the Tatar leaders in the citadel, and they captured them. The city was subsequently burned to the ground. About 110 to 100,000 slaves were taken captive, and about 60 to 70,000 Russians, who had been slaves of the Tatars, were freed. The city garrison was massacred. The fall of Kazan is of monumental importance in Russian history because it marked the end of the last meaningful stronghold that the Tatars possessed along the upper reaches of the Volga River. Four years later, in 1556, the city of Astrakhan, further to the south, would fall as well. At Astrakhan in 1556, the, the Muscovite soldiers reprised their victory. They captured the city uh, near the mouth of the Volga. This granted the Tsar, Ivan IV, full control of that principal arter, uh, water artery, water artery, excuse me, uh, in Western Russia. The Volga was now from north to south under the control of the Prince of Moscow. Again, these two victories taken together are of absolute central importance to the subsequent history of Russia. The Tatars, as a result of the fall of Kazan and Astrakhan, were crushed as a regional force. This also would bring a very large number of non-Slavic peoples under the control of Muscovy, making Muscovy now a fully-fledged, multi-ethnic, and multicultural empire. It also opened up all of Siberia now to expansion, as Kazan had been the last obstacle to Russian movement toward the east. This also serves as the formal establishment of Russia, not simply Moscow, not simply as a principality, but Russia as an empire. And over the course of the remainder of the 15th and the 16th centuries, we're going to see this process unfold here in a minute, Russia is going to move gradually eastward, expanding across the Siberian taiga until in the late 17th century it reaches the shores of the Pacific far to the east. The other thing that the, the falls of Kazan and Astrakhan did is they served to underscore Muscovite ideology and that sense that Moscow had arisen to take the place of Constantinople, the second Rome that had fallen in 1453. The church, which had been a key ally of Ivan IV in waging this campaign, in, in, in helping to draw up and, and generate support among the subjects for waging war against the non-Christian infidels, would be subsequently rewarded by the Tsar through the construction of new monasteries, uh, new churches, and the granting of very large landed estates to the Russian Orthodox Church hierarchy. This uh, icon from roughly the mid-1550s, around 1560, we're not exactly certain of the date, uh, known as Blessed Be the Host of the Heavenly Tsar, also known as the Church Militant, is an allegorical representation of the Lord's host, represented here by Ivan IV and his army surrounding and besieging uh, the city of Kazan, which is going to fall. The Blessed Mother of Kazan, the Lady Theotokos, uh, is there granting uh, her blessing over the troops and ensuring the victory of the holy Orthodox warriors. In celebration of the fall of Kazan and Astrakhan, Yvonne the Fourth, as I've already indicated, is going to grant the church new lands and build new monasteries. He is also going to order the construction of what is to this day arguably Russia's most well-known uh, architectural structure. A cathedral known as the Cathedral of the Intercession of the Most Holy Theotokos on the Moat, which is built between 1555 and 1561. 
uh, it is known today uh, as St. Basil's uh, to most people. It's, it's built on the former site of, 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 of Vasily, it was Russian for, for basil, uh, the site of a former uh, location of Vasily, uh, the Blessed. This is not the way the church looked after it was constructed. Uh, it was white. The colors actually are added later. It's, it's a, it's a late, later 17th century flourish. The onion domes as well, which are probably the signature idea behind the church, the signature image that the church calls to mind, um, are going to be added later as well. What is curious about this particular building is that it is utterly unlike anything that had ever come before. It represents an entirely new style of church architecture, suggesting some have argued that the flames lit road, rippling up, uh, the, the burning of, of Kazan, uh, but also of uh, the flames of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, this is, like I said, going to, it, it symbolizes here the growing power now and the might of the Tsar, and also that close synergy that existed between the state and the church during this point in uh, Russian history. So as I've already said, yes, sir. Is that in no, it's in Moscow. It's Moscow. Yeah, it's, it's, right, it's, it's at the uh, end of Red Square, uh, right next to the Kremlin. And we'll, we'll see over the course of the semester, we're going we're gonna to come back to Red Square and the Kremlin, and you're going to see it there. But yeah, that, that's in Moscow. St. Petersburg doesn't exist yet. That's next week. Okay. We're going to get to the foundation of St. Petersburg next week. So prior to the conquests of Kazan and Astrakhan, Russian expansion and settlement had largely been confined to the portions of the forest zone in and around Moscow. The, the Russian peasants, Slavic peasants, had trouble moving and, and expanding into the south because of the presence of those roaming bands of nomadic tribes, groups known as Cossacks, I'll talk about them a little bit later today. Those tribes moving toward the south, the presence of the Tatars toward the south as well, had prevented movement. Following the fall of Kazan and Astrakhan, however, with the weakening and the dissolution of Tatar power, settlement patterns shift. They had shifted after the fall of Kiev to the north and to the east, after the fall of Kazan and Astrakhan, the elimination of the Tatar threat, for all intents and purposes. Tatars are going to come back from time to time and cause trouble. They're going to raid Moscow a couple of times. They're going to burn Moscow at least one more time. But you guys get the idea. As a major political and military force, the Tatars are broken. Settlement patterns are now going to shift toward the south and toward the southeast, toward the mid-Volga and the steppe region, bringing now Slavic-speaking peoples closer and closer and bringing the Muscovite state closer and closer toward that rich, fertile Chornozion, the black soil region. That, once it can be secured, is going to aid immensely in agricultural production because that, of course, as we've discussed, is where the most fertile agricultural lands lie. <coughs> Russian colonists, indeed, would begin to establish their first footholds in the Black Earth region. And in the process, they would begin ejecting uh, Turks who had taken up a position on that land. Uh, and they would be assisted by the state. What the Muscovite state is going to do in order to encourage expansion, to encourage settlement, is to begin constructing a chain of fortresses, uh, fortress monasteries, uh, beginning in the 1570s along the Don River, all the way to the Irtush. And the, the fortresses then become not only strong military points, but it's around these fortress towns, using that old pattern of a Kremlin being established with the facade around it, those fortress towns, become the chief commercial and economic centers, as well as the centers of state authority in these lands. This too is of cardinal importance. What we do not see is we do not see uh, entrepreneur, we don't see these towns rising up as a result of trade and commerce. Rather, these towns are being established because they are outposts of state authority along this continually shifting, amorphous, and difficult to defend border. The new migratory outpourings are going to accompany uh, major political and economic upheavals into the 17th and the 18th centuries. Over that period, an estimated 2 million settlers are going to move from Russian central region lands into the steppe. And what we're going to see is a process of ethnic russification. Ethnic russification. And along with that, the process of converting or attempted to convert many of these non Orthodox Turkic peoples. So, russification and the spread missionary activity of Orthodoxy. All of which, of course, the church supports, and this is in part the church's reward for its close uh, ties with state authority. The other important development that emerges from this, not only is expansion opened up uh, toward the south, 
but the fall of Kazan on this map would be right about here. The fall of Kazan is going to open up as well the entire eastern expanse of Siberia to gradual settlement and colonization. Siberia is a staggeringly large and sparsely populated region. It is estimated that at the time of the fall of Kazan, across this entire Eurasian landmass, from just west of the Urals all the way to the Pacific, from the Arctic Ocean in the north to what it would at this point have been the, <coughs> region, or the, 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 the Mongolian lands, northern Mongolia here to the south, across this entire region, no more than perhaps 200,000 people lived. World's largest biome, very, very sparsely populated. But among those 200,000 indigenous people, there may have been as many as 100 different languages spoken. These are what the Russians are going to come to refer to as the small people or the little people. Nomadic tribes living off the land, many of them, if not nomadic, at least semi-nomadic, engaging in economies that are based largely upon things like reindeer herding, hunting with bows and arrows, engaging in things approaching hunter-gatherer societies as we would have seen in the Neolithic period, you know, four and, uh, three and 4,000 uh, years before the birth of Christ. Siberia is also, as I have intimated earlier, a storehouse of natural wealth. There is timber, fish, furs, the most important of which is this little weasel ferret-like thing called sable. Extremely soft, luxurious, dark fur that was highly prized by royalty in the West. Sable is going to emerge in the fifth, late 15th and 16th centuries as, as Imperial Russia's black gold. It was an immensely profitable uh, commodity uh, to trade in. Conquering Siberia, conquering Siberia is almost, it's, it's subcontracted out by Ivan IV, following the fall of Kazan. In order to ensure that this land is going to be brought formally under control, or it's just nominally under, nominally under control, but formally under uh, the, uh, the purview, the patrimony of the Tsar, uh, Ivan IV is going to turn to a very well-off peasant family from the White Sea region known as the Stroganovs. Uh, Stroganovs, sorry. The Stroganovs. You heard of B. Stroganov? This is allegedly after whom that dish is named. The Stroganovs um, had achieved, they had received earlier from the state, monopolies on the sale of salt and some furs in the White Sea region here to the far north. And this is the way that the Russian state, not unlike really other early modern states, the British would do this as well. We're going to see that here in a bit. The English, I should say, would do this as well in the 15th century. The state wanted a certain resource extracted. They wanted to begin a trade. What they would do is they, the state would turn uh, to a well-to-do family, uh, a family that would ally itself with the state and would grant to that family a monopoly. They are the only ones who can trade in this or that commodity. And in exchange for the, the wealth that they would accrue, having a monopoly on the sale of salt, salt's kind of important. They would then turn over to the state a set amount of money not the most efficient way of raising revenue, but when you don't have a lot of institutions and you're talking about lands that are difficult to access, you don't have much infrastructure, it's, <coughs> it's a convenient way for the state to secure at least some revenue from the central commodity. The Stroganovs had grown very, very wealthy uh, from their salt monopoly. They will grow wealthier still when they are subcontracted out, essentially, to settle Siberia. In 1558, Ivan IV is going to grant the Stroganovs estates along the Kama and Shusofaya rivers, and in exchange for their developing that land, cutting timber, establishing small manufactories, they get a 20-year tax exemption. So anything that they make, they get to keep 100%. They're also given special privileges. Ivan IV is no dummy. He's aware that although the, the Tatars have been crushed, there are, there are still going to be small bands of armed resistance in Siberia. So the Stroganovs are given another special privilege. They are going to be allowed to build forts and to recruit their own private army, which can then impose their will in these wild eastern lands. So the Stroganovs are going to oversee the initial pacification and colonization efforts of Siberia. 
In Russian history, American history, like all national histories, has its heroic figures. Uh, if, you're, if, uh, if you're Texan, if you're from Texas, it's you know, people like uh, Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone, Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston. If you're a Russian, one of the, one of the epic heroes, one of the great national heroes uh, about whom stories are told is a fellow by the name of Yermak Timofeyevich. Yermak Timofeyevich, who's shown here in an imagined portrait. Uh, he's born either in 1532 or 1542. We know he dies in 1585. We really have no idea what he looks like. We, the, 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 the portraits that, are, that we have that come down to us of him are painted on the basis of descriptions, written descriptions and oral legends about him. We, we, we don't actually have a, a, a portrait of him at the time. So this is an imaginary idea of what he may have looked like. Uh, Yermak, as he's typically known, was a Don Cossack. A Don Cossack. This was what, he was a member uh, of a semi-military community that had taken up uh, position and come to reside along uh, the Ukraine-Russian steppe. The Cossacks occupied the region of uh, early modern Russia that corresponds most closely to the American Wild West in, say, the 1860s or the 1870s. The Cossacks had emerged in two main groups. You've got your Zaporozhian Sich, S-I-C-H, and what is known as the Don Cossack Host. Timofeyevich, uh, Yermak Timofeyevich comes from the Don Cossack Host. These folks had emerged in the 14th and 15th centuries. They had comprised runaway peasants who had fled their masters, fled to the southern regions, deserters from the military, adventurers, freebooters, criminals, and thugs. And they had formed these, these semi-military communities that were also semi-autonomous, playing off the larger powers to the north and to the, the south, to the south, the Turks, to the north and west, the Poles, later the Poles and the Lithuanians, and uh, to, <coughs> to the north and to the east, Muscovy. Giddy entering into alliances, providing military service, and trying to maintain some semblance of self-rule. The Zaporozhians are going to become, the Zaporozhian Cossacks are going to become vassals of Poland Lithuania, although they're going to rebel in the mid-17th centuries for reasons we're going to talk about later on. As early as uh, the, the first years of the 16th century, the Don Cossacks ally themselves with the emerging Muscovite state. So this is where Yermak is going to come from. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's basically a mercenary, a, a man of adventure. In 1577, the Stroganovs, having received that charter to, to settle Siberia, are going to turn to the Cossacks. And they're going to recruit a number of Cossacks to come and fight to serve in that private army that they've been allowed to form by the Tsar. And among the Cossacks is this fellow Yermak. And he is going to quickly emerge as one of the principal leaders of the Cossacks who have been employed by the Stroganovs. In 1581 and 1582, Yermak is going to take his band of, of this private army, mercenaries, criminals, thugs, you name it, he's going to take them out into Siberia and begin the process of trying to pacify those first tribes located most closely along what is now this expanding Russian border. In October of 1582, in this highly, a highly romanticized uh, portrait, you're going to see a bunch of these today, uh, this is Vasily Surikov's The Conquest of Siberia by Yermak, painted in 1895, <coughs> depicting, uh, again, in this, in this romantic fashion, I suppose, uh, the, the capital of, uh, the, the capture of the capital of the Siberian Khanate on the lower Irtush River. It takes place on the 26th of October, 1582. This, this is going to open up the way for Russian expansion all the way now to the Pacific in the Far East. Yermak is, is the legendary figure among the Russians. When you think conquest of Siberia, you think Yermak, because he's the one who's going to take this, this band out. No more than 500 men. But what they, what they possess are things that the natives do not. And this is one of the things, one of the things we're going to come back to time and again uh, today. We see here the natives fighting here on the right with bows and arrows. Yermak and his adventurers are armed with gunpowder weapons. They're armed with muskets. And it's that technological advantage that the Muscovites, that the Russians possess over the indigenous peoples that is going to be so key to the settling of Siberia. What's going on at this time around the world elsewhere? 
What's going on in South America? In Central America, actually, what's already happened in South and Central America? Who's arrived? The Spanish. The Spanish, the Spanish conquistadors <coughs> with their plate armor, their large horses, and their guns and cannon. The Spanish conquistadors have already conquered the Maya, the Inca, the Aztecs. They've imposed Spanish control, at least nominally, over much of Central and South America. This should be understood as part of that larger global process, but it takes place in a different location. And Russia's imperial expansion, unlike Spanish and Portuguese, later British and French, Russia's imperial expansion takes place entirely over land. The European countries, the European states, are expanding across the waters. To North and South America, a little bit later on to the Indian subcontinent, and at the end of the, 18th, uh, end of the 19th century, onto the African continent itself. This is occurring a little bit later, but it's roughly, roughly contemporary with the, with the growing spread here of the first phase of European imperialism. <coughs> and like the Europeans in Latin and South, the Spanish or the Portuguese in Latin and South America, the Russians in Siberia are going to subjugate the indigenous peoples and they are going to provide additional monopolies to other entrepreneurs and other uh, high members of court, other rich uh, families that are capable of undertaking the work, they are going to provide them with further monopolies uh, in order to secure the lucrative fur trade, in order to begin timber industries. And the state will begin the process of augmenting the permanent settlement of Siberia by constructing forces along those major rivers just as it was doing in the southern steppe region in order to perform a defensive perimeter against the Turks. In time, uh, these new fortresses are going to grow into major frontier cities that exist to this day. Tomsk, Irkutsk, Nerchinsk, Akhutsk, 1647 already. Uh, uh, Kazan falls in 1552 uh, in less than 80 years. The Russians had made it in the middle of the 17th century all the way uh, to the Pacific Ocean. Now, the spread is rapid, but again, the area remains sparsely populated. It is one thing to have formal claim to these territories. It's one thing to have fortresses located along major rivers. It is another thing to say that these lands have been brought firmly under the control of the state. They have not. State authority extends only so far as actual individuals who represent state interests can act and impose the state's will. In other words, the state's control only exists insofar as its agents are capable of inflicting or promising to inflict violence on the locals. That is at the heart of the nature of state power, organized violence. Now, if you, can, uh, if you can claim legitimacy along with that, it makes you less likely to need to employ violence. But that implicit threat of violence is always present when you're dealing with the state authority, whether it's in the early middle period or early modern period, whether it's in the 21st century. That remains, to, that remains true. So within a century of Yermak's initial incursion, the Russians are going to reach the Pacific Ocean. By 1662, it's estimated that there may be as many as 70,000 Russian men living in Siberia. It was a relatively small, that's, that's almost the, only a little bit bigger than the population of Kiev in the late 12th century, okay, but just before the, uh, the Tatars arrived. 70,000 people is not that much for a territory that is that vast. China, to the south, is going to prove an obstacle to further advance in that direction. Um, but it's also going to serve as a stabilizing influence. There are going to be some initial encounters between the Russians and Chinese. The Russians realize that, well, China is just too big of a nut to crack. We're going to leave that alone. This more or less becomes in Mongolia serving as an intermediary or buffer zone between China to the south and Russia to the, uh, to the, uh, to the north. Japan, we will talk about toward the end of the semester. Japan is a special case unto itself. So while the defeat of the Tatars and the subjugation of the Siberian little peoples brought some type of a lasting peace or at least stabilization of Muscovy's eastern frontier, also providing then an outlet for settlement. This population begins to increase. You're going to begin sending people here to the east. Folks who don't want to go 
you know, because you're going to have you're going to have a little bit of difficulty convincing people uh, to, to, to uproot themselves <coughs> and to relocate. This is a very long journey, folks. A very long journey in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, if you're a civilian, if you're not a member of a, of a military expedition, how are you, how are you going to settle these lands? And as discoveries are made, the discovery of, of, of vast stores of iron and copper in the Ural Mountains uh, in the uh, 17th century, you're going to want people to come to work. You're going to want to begin extracting from the rivers, the fish, the timber, the furs. How do you populate this area? Well, you can give grants of land uh, to large families and grant them estates. Another one of the things that the Tsarist government is going to begin doing is using Siberia as a, as a safety valve for the dispatch of political opposition and prisoners. Very early on, Siberia becomes sort of a storehouse. It's a place that you go, you exile people to Siberia, in part to get rid of them. Because if you're in the Far East, you're far removed from the seat of power, you can't influence those. Uh, but also then, you're finding a way of forcibly settling and developing the region. This is going to be another uh, continuity in Russian history, all the way through the Soviet period. All the same, by the, the late 16th, early 17th century, Russia's situation to the east and mostly to the south, mostly to the south, along the lower Volga, because we now control the Russians control the Volga all the way to the Caspian Sea. Those two regions have been more or less pacified, you're <coughs> secure. This is that part of that theme that we talked about a couple of weeks ago of security, the prostrans to the vast territory that provides a degree of insecurity. But as the eastern and southern borders are becoming more or less secure, the newly emergent Muscovite state, the Russian Empire, faces a graver challenge. Now, that is a challenge that is coming not from the east or from the south. It's coming from the west. From European states, European entities like Poland, and Sweden, Lithuania, and the German-speaking lands. There, the Russian state confronts a host of challenges from neighbors who are more advanced from a technological standpoint, who have better developed economies, who are wealthier, and who have more developed socio-political institutions that are capable of organizing, administering, and dispatching the wills of their sovereigns in the form of military authority, but also in the form um, of socio uh, and economic influence. The West, by the early 16th century, and by the, well, actually by the early 17th century, we're talking about now, around 1600, uh, the West has grown increasingly powerful, thanks to gradual improvements, in particular, in firearms. The introduction uh, in the 15th century of bronze cannon, gradual improvements uh, in muskets, but more significant improvements in the organization <coughs> and, the, and the dispatch and the use of gunpowder weapons on the battlefield. The West has fully undergone its gunpowder revolution by 1630, 1635. The Russian state has to have some way of trying to encounter this. And this is going to be the story. This is one of the main stories during the period in which Ivan IV sits on the throne, is how you make that transition from that military admixture that he had in Kazan, where you had you know, traditional uh, bowmen and, 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 and cavalry, alongside cannon, alongside Dutch miners, alongside Russian shooters. That is not a military force, while it was adequate for fighting the Tatars on the steps and besieging design. That is not a military force that is going to be well adapted to, a, to going up against, say, the Poles or the Lithuanians. Certainly not the Swedes. The victories at Kazan and Astrakhan for Ivan IV were, in no small part, outgrowths of the success that the Russian state had had up to that point in introducing gunpowder into its military ranks. As I talked uh, briefly last week, last time we met, gunpowder had arrived in Russia sometime during the course of the late 14th century, coming the long way. It didn't come directly from China. Rather, the Europeans took it, developed it, and it came to Russia from the West. So it comes to Russia via a European intermediary. It would have a significant impact on the ways that Russians fought only beginning in the late 15th and in the early 16th century. And Kazan is the great example of how gunpowder now has transformed the Muscovite military. What is important to keep in mind is that the gunpowder revolution that Russia undergoes 
begins rather later, about 50 to 60 years later than it had begun in the West. This is another recurrent theme in Russian history, and that is the idea of delayed development. For whatever reason, Russia has seen for, for many, many years, hundreds of years, to be about a step or a step and a half behind from a technological standpoint where folks are in the West. It's not to say there haven't been Russian technological and scientific breakthroughs. We're going to talk about some of those later in the semester. What is different, however, is that when those technological breakthroughs have emerged, their diffusion, their, their spread throughout Russian society, Russian culture, the Russian economy, Russian industry, has been delayed. You might have, and we're going to find out later today, printing appear in Moscow in the late 15th century. Uh, I'm sorry, that's too early. Uh, printing appear in Slavic-speaking lands in the late 15th century. It arrives later in, Mos in, 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 in Russia. But printing, private printing presses, don't emerge for a very, very long time. The technology doesn't diffuse, if that makes sense. It's one thing to have one technological gadget. It's another thing for everybody to have it. Okay. Technolo technology diffuses more quickly as we get closer and closer to the modern era. IPod, or, I'm sorry, iPhone comes out in 2007. Now everybody's got an iPhone iPhone 6 or whatever iteration that we're on now within only eight years, six different iterations. <coughs> technology improves, technology diffuses. That process is slower, obviously, in the early modern period, but it's slower still for Russia. Russian artillery, its use of its cannons, of course, had originated both from foreign and domestic sources. I had mentioned very, very briefly at the end of the last time we met an Italian by the name of Aristotle Fiorovante. Fiorovante. He is... Fio He is the Italian engineer who was brought in by Ivan III to oversee the construction of the Cathedral of the Dormition in Moscow. He's not only an architect, an architect he is also adept at bronze casting. And Fiorovanti's entry, his arrival in Russia in 1478, 1478 uh, uh, during the reign of Ivan III, Ivan the Great, uh, is going to bring casting technology for bronze into Russia. Seven years later, in 1485, Russia casts its first bronze cannon. But bronze is very expensive, so the casting of bronze isn't going to diffuse rapidly in Russia. Russia does not have native supplies of copper at the time. You need two things for bronze, copper and tin. So the copper has to be imported from the West, principally from Sweden. Sweden's a rival power, politically, militarily, and diplomatically. If you're the Swedes, do you want to trade bronze to the Russians? Of course not, because what are the Russians going to do with the bronze? They're going to cast cannon that potentially could be used against you. So the Russians are going to face periodic embargoes of things like copper. They do begin, however, casting in very large numbers cheaper, less efficient, but nevertheless usable iron cannon. And foreign observers for many, many years are going to remark upon the, the fact that Russian armaments tended to be of below quality vis-a-vis -vis their Western counterparts. What Russia would make up for, this they would, the Russians would make up for this technical deficiency by simply amassing an extraordinarily large amount of cannon. So the iron, the iron cannons may be less efficient. They may not be up to the standards of the bronze cannon, but if you have a bunch more of them, you try and make up the difference. And you can do this in the 16th century in a way that makes it more, diffi it's, it's more difficult to do in the 20th and the 21st centuries. These are themes that get carried over in, into the class on the Soviet Union. All the same, as early, by the reign of, as early as the reign of Ivan III, native cannon masters were already at work in Muscovy, the most famous of which is a fellow by the name of Andrei Chokhov, whose career is going to span, span more than six decades from 1568 to 1632. He is going to create his masterpiece in 1585-1586. It's known as Tsar Pushka, or the Tsar Cannon. It remains to this day the largest howitzer ever created, besides its caliber. 89 centimeter caliber Tsar Pushka. Did it fire? Um, we believe it fired once. We believe it fired once. The tests were done, I think, back in the 1960s when it was, because it's, 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 it's in the Kremlin grounds, inside the Kremlin walls, the Kremlin grounds. It's been moved a couple of times. And at one point, 
when they were in the process of moving, I want to say it was the 60s, although I might be off on that, they did some tests inside the barrel and they detected what they thought was gunpowder residue, suspecting that it had been fired at least one time. But that was it. Right. If once, if it was fired once, if it was fired at all, it was only fired once. It's it, highly decorative. It is highly decorative, but oh, that's true of a lot of cannon at that time. It, not just because this is sort of pushed up. Um, it was an example here of the, of, the, of the skill to which Russian cannon makers were able to reach. And this is, this is a bronze casting. This is not an iron cannon. It's a bronze casting. 15 foot long barrel, and it, weighed, it weighs 40 tons. So it's a bit of a monster. It was designed, it was originally thought maybe to scare the Tatars and to serve as an intimidating uh, weapon. Uh, although, again, it's never, it's never actually used in combat. But the point is it's an ex early example of how Russians were able uh, not only to develop, I mean, if, if only singular, excellent uh, devices, but it also introduces another recurrent theme, and that is the right, or underlines a recurrent theme, and that is Russian state leaders' love of what I'm going to call showpiece technologies. It's a display item. Look at what we can do. Well, did you use it against the poles? But look at what we can do. Be careful. Okay. In some ways, uh, the creation of the, the Cathedral of Dormition is like that. I had mentioned that last time we had met. This gigantic, this gigantic imposing church using the latest technology, singular design, is symbolic of what the state can do, and thus is designed to intimidate or to impress. Artillery is, of course, not the only aspect of the gunpowder revolution that is worth mentioning. It is during uh, the reign of, of uh, Ivan, Ivan III and then uh, Vasily III the, 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 the that the first Russian corps of infantry that used firearms, <coughs> they are known as a pishalniki. This would be singular. The form of the plural is add an I, pishalniki. If you look here in this illustration, what you see is that they're standing alongside, the shalik is standing alongside one of those tufiak, those emplaced cannon that had been used uh, as early as 1382 in the defense of Moscow, again, the unsuccessful defense of Moscow against the Tatars. The Pashalniki began as what we would call in the West artillerists. Artillerists, they were artillerymen. They were named for that pishal. Uh, a small caliber cannon, the original ones are Tufiak, and they become, they become known as uh, a, a Pishad. It's a small caliber cannon, about 30 to 40 millimeters, uh, that was used in the defense of fortresses. The Pishalniki are, are, remain tied to fortress defense throughout their history. A little bit later on, they're going to begin employing as well shoulder-fired weapons, similar to that European arc boost that we discussed last week. But the first real infantry group are not the Pishaniki, they're artillerists. Those instead uh, would be a group known as uh, Streltsi, or shooters. Two things I need to say, and I'll show you the Streltsi and talk about them in a second, about both the Pishaniki and the Streltsi. These units would be formed when needed, used in battle, and then disbanded. They are not permanent standing units. That's an important distinction. That's an important distinction. So you're going to have as many as a thousand Pishalniki outfitted as early as 1510 at treasury expense. And they're used by the Muscovite state to capture the city of Pskov and to take the city of Smolensk. We're going to talk about Smolensk later. Uh, Smolensk is going to be taken from the Poles. Um, it's, uh, yes, ma'am. Are the Pishalniki the people who use this is a Pishanik. Okay. This is a Pishan. It looks like a Tufyan. Okay. Pishanik, Pishan. Okay. okay. Uh, Chinovnik, uh, you, you use that, that N-I-K, it's a, like a person who does something or a person associated. So a Chinovnik, that's your Russian word for bureaucrat. It comes from the word Chin, which means rank. We're going to cover that too. That comes under Peter the Great. That's next week. So that Pishalnik that indicates the individual who is attached <coughs> to the item, if that makes sense. So, there, so 
They're going to be disbanded after every campaign, which is more or less the way that you would have done things in the Middle Ages. So that these guys who are basically ser they're servitors of the crown, after the military campaign is over with, they've got to go back and, and oversee their land and estates. They've got to take care of business. This is not what they do on a regular basis. These are not, in other words, professional standing uh, army men. The first standing firearm units in Russian history are going to evolve out of the Streltsy. Streltsy. And here's a picture of Streltsy, uh, roughly 1674. And they're noteworthy for two things. One, the fact that Streltsy, um, who emerge early in the reign of our fellow Ivan IV, they emerge around 1545-1550. They are going to see their first combat use at the Siege of Kazan. 3,000 men are selected from the Pishalniki. 3,000 Pishalniki, and you're going to transform them into Streltsy. You're going to, they're going to become, they're going to take the artillerymen, and you're going to turn them into shooters. And Streltsy means shooter. Think musketeer. Here's, here's the fellow's gun right here. Okay, he's holding, he's holding his musket right here in his left hand. What the hell is this? Why is he holding a gigantic axe in his right? Well, you know, he too close. In part, in part. Don't hold up the gun. The other thing that you need that axe for, remember we talked about the arc boost last week. Arc boost, because it's so heavy, and it takes so long to fire, the initial ones were wick loaded, you had to rest it on something. What the Strelci use is they use these giant axes, and you can see here at the top of the axe a little notch. You would knock the axe into the ground, and then you could rest the musket or the arc boost in the crux there of the axe. Right? So you actually have two weapons. And what's interesting about the Strelci, like I said, that 3,000 of those Pishalniki are going to be formed into six units of Strelci, and they serve in Moscow. And very quickly, they emerge into a type of military caste. <coughs> They're housed in special sections of the city, set aside from the rest of the population. They're given special bright red uniforms to wear. Here we see some here on the right. Okay. They're given bright red uniforms to wear. Um, they're, ha they're housed alongside their families. They're not in barracks. So you have a settlement of Streltsy living with their families, and they're allowed to farm and conduct trade in peacetime to supplement their annual income from the state. So they get an annual income, but they get a supplement with farming and that sort of thing. And they're a military caste in the sense that if you're the son of a Streltsy, you're probably going to be a Streltsy. You're going to follow in your father's footsteps. More often than not, the Streltsy are going to come to be used as well in peacetime as a military or policing force. And they serve that kind of a function. And what you're seeing here in this uh, late 19th century reproduction by Sinti uh, Ivana Streltsy is you're seeing the Streltsy marching here to the city. Um, you can see their guns here in the, in the background making a display. Here are some uh, later cannon. <clears throat> they serve as the armed, uh, the armed police force of the state beginning in the reign of Ivan IV. Their use in battle is going to be a little bit different from Western Musketeers. Western Musketeers by this time in, 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 in Poland, in, in, in Lithuania, in Sweden, are being incorporated <coughs> more and more into what we would call combined arms warfare. It's a particular form of warfare that emerged in the 16th and, and early 17th centuries that brings together three otherwise disparate and distinct military units. Musketeers, or infantry, cavalry, traditional form of, of projection of force, and pikemen, pikemen. A pikeman is a fellow with a maybe plate armor or light armor who carries a long pointy stick or spear. And in combined arms warfare that emerges in Europe over the course of the, of the late 15th, most of the 16th century, it's a positional kind of battle where you have set formations. And each one of these three elements of the combined arms warfare of early modern Europe is designed to counteract another one of those elements. The cavalry are the shock force. You want to use your cavalry to disrupt your opponent's musketeers. Musket, musketeer can discharge his weapon, but that cavalryman can cover a lot of ground very quickly because he's on back of course. 
horse gallops into the ranks of those armed with the muskets, you're going to decimate the musketeers. So you have pikemen in place alongside the musketeers to defend against the cavalry. The pikemen's job is very simple. You maneuver out in front of the army and you receive the cavalry charge. How do you do that? You do that by setting your pike and getting the horses and the cavalry charge to impale themselves on the end of your long pointy sticks. While then you have musketeers in an attempt to disrupt and disband the enemy's pikemen. That's what we call combined arms warfare. So European, Europe, Europe is developing sort of a formalized type of positional warfare that relies very heavily on logistics, on battlefield maneuver. A battlefield, we can look at a, we can look at a schematic <coughs> of a 17th century battle, we can say, oh, here are the pikemen, there's a nice tercio, it's a square formation, and look at all this. That's not the way battles are fought. A battlefield is a place of carnage, of terror, fear, of death, and of panic. The key for these types of war, this type of battle to be undertaken was training, training, and more training so that your troops would be able to maneuver at exactly the right point when they saw the banner change or they heard uh, the, the cadence from the bugle or the drum, the horn or the drum. That's when you do, that's how you communicate the long side or along this, this extended front. It's a positional kind of warfare. We are not there yet with the Russians. The Russians are just now incorporating our, uh, their Streltsy. They were very seldom sent into pitched battles, very seldom. They typically fought behind fixed positions or fortifications, and they would be protected by cavalry. I talked last week briefly about the, the wandering town, Gulyaygorod, those walls that were established out on the steppe. That's what the Streltsy fought behind. They're not being thrown into a, a melee, a one-on-one -on -one melee. So Russian artillery, Russian pishalniki, and Russian infantry, this emerging infantry force of musketeers, the Stelzi, prove up to the task against the Tatars. Both are present at the conquest of Kazan. Both are present at the conquest of Astrakhan. The problem that Ivan IV faces in the 1560s, 1570s, and 1580s is that with the Tatars now having been suppressed to the east, and the southern steppe territory being gradually brought under his control, his most formidable foe is coming from the west, from the west, where they have combined arms, where they have more advanced integration of musketeers and artillery, and still cavalry and pikemen. They have more advanced economies, greater wealth, greater population density, meaning it's easier to collect taxes and to conscript, conscript troops into the army. This is going to be the challenge that Russia faces. Russia is caught now between that eastern legacy and the contemporary west. The legacy of the Pishadniki and the Stelzi, and the contemporary reality of combined arms warfare in the west, what can be done? Internal events, some unexpected, beyond the control of the crown, some self-inflicted by the Tsar himself. Internal events are going to conspire to ensure that the Russian Empire would prove to be far less equipped to meet that Western challenge than it was to subjugate the Tatars to the east. This will be characteristic of the difficulty that Russia is going to face in its confrontation with Western Europe from the early 16th century, frankly, to the present. Another series of recurrent themes that we're about to introduce. The conflict that Ivan IV launches in the aftermath of the victories at Kazan and Astrakhan against the Tatars, the conflict that he embarks upon in the West is going to prove almost immediately that Russia is not up to the challenge and that much remains to be done if Russia is going to compete with European states on a European level. If Russia is going to make that transition from an Asiatic, semi-Asiatic state into an entity, a polity, that can stand with the Western Europeans and the Central Europeans on an equal footing. But before we go there, I should probably introduce rather belatedly our protagonist for the day, Ivan IV, shown here in one of the most famous portraits in Russian history, Viktor Vasilyevsky, Ivan Grozny, painted in 1897.
Ivan IV is one of Russia's most consequential rulers. He ranks up there in the country's more than thousand year history alongside such individuals as Peter the Great, we'll meet him next week, and Joseph Stalin. Three of the most consequential Russian leaders and frankly three of the most consequential individuals in the history of Europe and the world. It is under Ivan IV, of course, that Russia would emerge as a formal empire. He would also begin the process of constructing a more modern military in order to expand his state and in order to secure his lands from the threat of its western neighbors, specifically and most immediately the Poles and the powerhouse Lithuanians. Lithuanians were at one time a formidable force. Russia's largest and most important internal threat was actually the Tsar himself. He is going to engage in a whole host of activities, especially in the second half of his reign, that will bring woe, misfortune, and death to the Russian lands. We've already talked about here the series of events that have transpired that would lead Russia to fall behind the West as it turned uh, westward following Kazan and Astrakhan to try and confront the West. Russia was simply ill-equipped. Ivan IV flush off his victories, however, against the Tatars, recognized that one of the challenges that he faced, although these lands were opening up here, this is here around 1550, here is here are the Russian lands. This is the Duchy, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The Kingdom of Poland, these two are going to formally unite in 1569 to form something known as the, the, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. They do so in order to be more effective in fighting against the armies of Ivan IV. Recognizing that his eastern boundary is secure, but recognizing as well that trade and commerce with the West was essential, Yvonne is going to look this way in the hopes of securing important port cities, commercial and trading centers along the Baltic that the Lithuanians possess. And in 1558, he is going to launch a most consequential war. It's known as the Livonian War. Yes, ma'am? Siberia not included? Siberia is, well, we haven't quite gotten, this is 1550. Yermak hasn't quite yet begun his, his, west, his eastward expansion. Okay. So we're butting up against here the Ural Mountains. Yermak is going to begin here in about 30 years or so, this, this movement in earnest to the east. What Ivan IV hoped to do was to conquer those Baltic ports to facilitate growing trade and commerce with the west. And in 1558, he is going to invade uh, regions. And let's go back here so we can see where we are, orient ourselves in this map. We're looking at this area right in here, right in here. He is going to launch an invasion of neighboring, uh, 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 the neighboring uh, Livonian region, which constitutes today uh, uh, lands in Estonia and Latvia, for those of you who are familiar with Baltic uh, geography. The Russians are going to achieve a degree of initial success in their war of conquest, but that is quickly going to be reversed when the Poles come to the aid of the Lithuanians and ally themselves as well with Denmark and Sweden. So in short order, Ivan finds himself fighting against a coalition of Scandinavian uh, neighbors. Now, the war is going to ebb and flow over the years. It's not constant warfare. This is the early modern period. You go to war in the spring. You battle during the summer. You go to war in the fall. You rest during the winter. It's not constant fighting. But the pitched battles that occur are going to prove, nevertheless, to be drains on resources, on human resources, also on gold and the treasury. The war begins to turn sour for Ivan by the mid-1560s. This war is going to last a long time, 1558 to 1582. That's, my math of magic tells me, 24 years off and on fighting, draining the treasury, draining men, causing disruptions for the economy, causing disruptions with trade. In 1564, one of Ivan's leading generals and military advisors, a fellow by the name of Andrei Kurtsky. Kurtsky. I'm not going to say too much about him if I was teaching, uh, oops, 
If I was teaching a class just on early modern Russia, we would talk a lot about Andrei Kurbsky. Kurbsky is a leading general. He defects. He leaves Ivan's service and goes over to the enemy's side. And we have what is known as the, 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 the Grozny, or the terrible, the Kurbsky, the Grozny Kurbsky correspondence. Whether or not these things are real, whether or not they're written later, from our standpoint, it's not important, but passed down to us. There's correspondence that allegedly goes. Kurbsky writes to Tsar, telling him what an awful human being he is and why he's why he's defective. The Tsar writes back to say, up yours, buddy. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but it's, it's, this, is a, this is a formidable moment here in Yvonne's psychology because that man's a traitor. Traitor amongst your leaders? If you had one traitor? might be more. Your side is infected, perhaps. Individuals who are going to side not only with the enemy, but with the Latin West. Catholic. Poles are Catholic. Lithuanians are Catholic. Swedes and, uh, and, uh, and Danes, they're, they're, they're not Roman, uh, they're not uh, Russian Orthodox. These are, the, these are heretics. So there's a, there's a religious aspect of this war as well. 1569, Poland and Lithuania forms into a, con, uh, into a commonwealth to better aid themselves, uh, to better coordinate their activities. 1570, Sweden formally joins the war, uh, 12 years into the battle. And Russia, the Russian armies under Ivan IV are going to experience a series of resounding defeats. And the reason they are defeated time and time again is because of the infantry armed and more capable of using gunpowder weapons that the Western forces possess. And the Western forces have very large, substantial artillery parks. They've got a lot of bronze cannon that they can use in their fortress defense. They have advantages. They're wealthier. They have more advanced technology. They're used to fighting in this fashion. The other major problem, and this goes back to something that we talked about the very first day, the other major problem that Yvonne the Fourth faces is that perennial concern, that perennial issue of surplus scarcity. The Russian economy is less well developed. Russia, despite its vast wealth, its emerging wealth in Siberia, is a poorer country. It is larger than any other country in Europe at this point, but its population density is minuscule compared with the population densities of major Western European states. Here, here are some figures. The, the, these figures actually come from 1700, the, 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 the earliest ones I could get, but they give you an idea here. The, the, this is true as well in the late 16th century. Around 1700, Russia has a population of only five to nine million people. Its population density in European Russia, ignore Siberia, its population in European Russia, the areas west of the Ural Mountain, its population density is about six people per mile. Poland's population density is eight per mile. In France and along the Rhineland, 39 per square mile. In Belgium and Westphalia, some of the most industrially developed areas, most urban centers of Europe, 52 per square mile. That is an order of magnitude larger than Russia's population density. And these disp disparities in population are also you, you are accompanied by disparities in wealth. Russia has a smaller tax base. It has a smaller population. It also has a smaller pool, if it has a smaller population, it has a smaller pool of military recruits to draw upon. Low population density makes it difficult to supply the army. It makes it more difficult to, to raise taxes because you have to send folks out into those hinterlands to where the people are located in those urban settlements, collect the taxes and make your way all the way back. So population density and small population, lack of urbanization are significant problems. And if that was all that the Russians faced, it would be bad enough. But it's not. The 1560s, as the war against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is beginning to heat up, during the 1560s, the Russians suffer a series of crop failures. We talked about this as well. It's part of that, that surplus scarcity issue. Crop failures lead to malnutrition. Malnutrition leads to weakened immune systems. Weakened immune systems in the early modern period invariably lead to epidemic, including the spread of plague. And there are going to be a series of epidemics that are going to strike the Russian lands well into the 1570s. 
one kills as many as 10,000 people in the city of Novgorod. In 1570, at the height of one particularly virulent epidemic in Moscow, in the year 1570, it's estimated that between 600 and 1,000 people died in Moscow every day. So we're talking here, now it doesn't occur the entire year, the place would be entirely depopulated, but you guys get the idea. When the, when the epidemic is at its worst, you're seeing large populations die off, and that, that's only going to exacerbate the problem because you have sanitation issues, you have, of course, the panic that sets in, it's a major health concern, and we're dealing with a, a town or a city, a, a country that does not have a well-developed medical infrastructure. In 1571, the Tatars organize a raid and sack Moscow. <laughs> Gone, but not forgotten. Now, the situation by 1571-1572 is, is very, very serious. The ongoing Livonian War, and as the Livonian War begins to really turn sour for Ivan IV, <coughs> when Ivan IV begins to enter into a very dark time in his personal history, and it ends up being a very dark time in Russian history as well. The second half of Ivan's reign, roughly the 1570s, uh, um, up until um, his, uh, his death in 1584 is marked by chaos, instability, widespread uh, political terror, and uh, some historians have hypothesized Ivan IV's descent into madness. Whether or not he was clinically insane is something, of course, we cannot ever know for certain. But his actions during this period suggest, if nothing else, he was at least extraordinarily obsessive and increasingly prone to violence um, against not only uh, his political opponents, but against uh, members of his own family. Kurbsky's defection in 1564 followed soon thereafter by the death of his wife. He's actually been married uh, uh, seven times. One of, his, one of his beloved wives seemed to have served as a tipping point for this switch. Some historians have referred uh, to a good Ivan, bad Ivan. First half of Ivan's reign, it's pretty good. Kazan, Astrakhan, expanding state boundaries. Second half, following the onset of the Livonian War and Kurbsky's uh, uh, tra traitorous uh, defection, bad Ivan. Okay. Sort of a yin and yang of, a, of the good guy, the bad guy. What, what was the cause of it? Was it his first wife's death? We don't know. Uh, was it Kurbsky's defection? It might have been. He, he, Ivan grows increasingly suspicious. He grows increasingly obsessed with the ideas that there are conspiracies all about being plotted against him. He is convinced that his first wife's death was caused by enemies who had poisoned her. He also, uh, archaeologists have later surmised, um, and, and historians have surmised, based upon the evidence that we have, he may have, he may have suffered as well from a considerable and debilitating spinal injury that was also affecting his mental faculties. But it is clear that his, men his mental faculties deteriorate during the second half of his reign. From the middle of the 1560s until 1583, 1584, Russia enters into the beginning of a very, very dark time. Fearing treason all around him, the Tsar begins ruthlessly eliminating people. Anyone who is not only recognized as being an enemy, some who are simply suspected of being enemies. He does this through the establishment of a new type of court. It is known as Oprichina. Its members, going back to Arkushalniki, are Oprichniki. Oprichina is a word that refers uh, specifically to a, a separate court. Well, preaching means separate court, and it's a separate court that Ivan IV is going to form that coexists alongside the official court in Moscow. So you have the official court, Moscovite court, but you have Oprichina. This would be akin to Ivan setting up a formal structure for ruling his personal property, his personal domain. It is going to be staffed by Oprichniki. And you're seeing some of the supplicants here to the Tsar. Oprichniki he was Ivan IV. And here are his servitors, the Oprichniki, looking in this, uh, this painting uh, by Nikolai uh, Nevrev, rather obsequious. 
They're coming for something. They want something. And indeed, they do. They want the authority, the money, and the power that the Tsar is about to give to them. The Aprichniki are it's a very odd group. They're organized along the lines of a monastery. And as Ivan IV descends into this dark time, he becomes increasingly mystical, increasingly religious, attending a liturgy, entering into confession, praying many hours a day, while at the same time inflicting violence and despair upon his people. The members of the Aprichniki, when they head out into public, dress in all black. They call each other brother. They carry with them brooms on the back of their horses, alongside their horses, because they are there to sweep out treason, to sweep out heretics, to sweep the Russian land and its enemies. And alongside the brooms, they attach to the head to their saddles the severed heads of dogs, symbolizing their obedient loyalty to their master, Tsar Ivan IV himself. They too, like their sovereign, engage in long hours of prayer, alternating with drunken bacchanalias and orgies. They become the personal bodyguard for what the Tsar refers to as his personal estate, that Oprichina. Some of them are members of the gentry. Some of them are German mercenaries, oddly enough. Some are drawn from the ranks of commoners. The Oprichina, in time, would come to include half of the entire empire. And the Oprichniki would be rewarded for their loyalty and their service by the Tsar with land grants. Find a traitor, kill him, exile his family, take his land. There you go. Well, not you guys are ladies. Got to give Oprichniki after you mail. Sorry. Give you guys that land of the state for your loyal service to the Tsar. Novgorod would be plundered in 1570. It's one of the Tsar's cities, but fearing that it was going to go over to the Polish side, the Lithuanian side, Novgorod is plundered. Essentially, the Oprichina are going to run riot from about 1564 when they're formed until 1572. They're allowed to run riot. They do whatever the Tsar... They, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short reign of terror until 1572, during which time Ivan, curiously keeps a list of all the men who were murdered on his orders. And he distributes increasingly large sums of money to monasteries and to churches so that they will pray for the eternal rest and repose of the souls of those he has victimized. <laughs> it's very odd behavior. The list contains thousands of names. Thousands of names of individuals murdered on the Tsar's direct orders. Russia has entered a dark time in the second half of Ivan's reign. It's about to get worse. Ivan's death in 1584 creates a secession crisis. Who's supposed to follow the Tsar? And another one of the constants in Russian history, Russians, Slavs in general, but Russians in particular, tend to do really, really poorly when it comes to the formal transition of power from one ruler to another. This is an example of just one of those times. The secession crisis that comes as a result of Ivan's death is brought about by Ivan himself. In 1581, in 1581, Ivan confronted his daughter-in-law over the fact that she was wearing immodest clothing. By this time, Ivan has really sort of developed his mystical religious ideas about what is wrong and what is proper. And when she doesn't agree with him, he beats her. She was pregnant and miscarries later. And this carriage comes later. Learning that his wife had been beaten by his father, <coughs> Yvonne's son confronts his dad, and in the course of a very heated argument, 
Yvonne picks up his royal scepter, strikes his son in the head, crushing his skull and killing him on the spot. This is the most famous painting of Yvonne IV. Yavyad Epin's Yvonne the Terrible and his son, November 15th, 1581. It is a terrifying portrait. Yvonne the Fourth lost in utter madness at the same time realizing what he has done in a moment of anger. The death of Yvonne's immediate successor is going to lead to a crisis. His next eldest surviving son, Fyodor, will ascend to the throne following Yvonne's death in 1584. Fyodor is mentally weak. He's physically weak. I mean, he's, he's mentally challenged. He's, he's, we used to call it retarded, whatever we call it nowadays. Okay, he has sub, subnormal intelligence. He will officially rule from 1584 until his death in 1598, but because he's mentally incapacitated, he is going to rule under what is known as a regency. A regency. This is typically what happens when the heir to the throne ascends but is a minor, under 18 typically, or in, in Fyodor's case, is mentally deficient. You have to have a regent <coughs> who can actually oversee the day-to-day -day operations of state business. What was the name of Fyodor. Fyodor. F-E-D-O-R. Uh, stressed E in Russian is a yo. Fyodor. Fyodor the first. His regency is going to last for 15 years. Who's going to emerge as regent? Well, as soon as Ivan IV dies, all of the leading boyars, those noble elites who are around the court, some of whom served in the Aprichina, the Aprichniki, they've been his advisors, the boyar clans, because each one represents a major family, goes all the way back to the Rurikid dynasty, and Russia is based upon clans or families. The Boyar families are going to begin jockeying for power with one another to see who is going to emerge as the regent and really the power behind the throne. The fellow who emerges from all of this is a guy by the name of Boris Gudunov. Boris Gudunov, who, well, as we see here, is going to serve as regent from 1584 to 1598, after which he is controversially going to take the title Tsar. He's going to be crowned Tsar and will serve as Tsar from 1598 to 1605. Was the other boy like dead? Yes, he dies in 1598. Under, uh, under circumstances that some think were mysterious. <coughs> but we'll get to that after the break. You guys stretch your legs.